Welcome and good morning. Thanks for joining us in worship this morning. We're grateful to have you with us. My name is Jeff Japinga. I'm the executive presbyter of the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area. 60 congregations in East Central and Southern Minnesota and far Western Wisconsin committed to serving together in the ministry of the Presbyterian Church, committed to supporting each other in the ministries to each of their communities. The Presbytery of the Twin Cities area was an early adopter of the Matthew 25 initiative of the Presbyterian Church USA, committing itself to building vital congregations, eradicating systemic poverty and dismantling structural racism. We're proud to be a part of that effort, proud to make that a focus of our work, not just as a presbytery, but in all of our congregations and in the ministry that we do. And today, we're proud and honored to welcome the Reverend Diane Moffat, Chief Executive and President of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, the originator of the Matthew 25 initiative. Diane will bring us the scripture and message this morning as we worship God together. We're also grateful for PTCA member and chaplain Chad Jones for writing the liturgy today and offering it to us. Thank you for being a part of this worship. Come, let us worship God.
Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and welcome everyone to worship this morning. It's awesome to have each of you worshiping, even if it's not in person and it's on screen. We're all together in spirit, so it's wonderful to be worshiping God with each of you today. Will you please join me in the call to worship? Rejoice in the light of the morning. Give thanks for the sun's energy, even through clouds of darkness. God has spoken to us and meets us here. We live in covenant with the Eternal One. Gather in the spirit of Jesus, whose name we bear. Thank God for truth that lives in spite of death. We celebrate the faithful witness of Jesus Christ. We seek to share the good news that Christ reigns. The Spirit encounters us here that we might learn. The Spirit inspires us that we might serve. God anoints us for ministry, giving us tasks to do. God's word is on our tongues that the world may believe. doesn't call us to a blind faith, but to a faith that is eye-opening and mind-expanding. But we often find it more beneficial for ourselves if we pretend we cannot see or understand God's vision for creation. So please join me in the prayer of confession, as on the screen. O oh God, you have called us to be apostles of your grace and truth in a broken world. But we have fallen well short. We continue to turn a blind eye to others' pain or to understand the source of their tears. We avoid those who are angry, embittered, or disillusioned. We far too often choose what is comfortable over what is right. It is easier to dismiss the feelings of others than to offer true empathy. We would rather reject than encounter their reality. Yet you come to us, O oh God, as a bearer of light. Help us to reach our full potential and mirror the light to others. Embolden us to go beyond our comfort zone and be a source of the change you desire in this world. Amen.
We are known by God. We are loved by God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. May we use this forgiveness to be inspired to see God's vision of what this world could become. Our Hebrew scripture lesson this morning is from Psalm 81, verses 1 through 10. I listen for God's word to you. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our festal day. For it is a status for Israel, an ordinance for the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a voice I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Salah. Hear, O my people, when I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Will the children come forward, please? That's you, kids of the PTCA watching from home. Hop down off your couches, come to the living room floor, get yourself comfortable just like you were here in church sitting next to me. I know it's a little different today that we're watching this on the television and you're not uh, here next to me, but we're gonna do the best that we can. And I brought something here with me today to show you. I bet you've seen one of these before. I bet you have one of these in your home. Some are big, some are small like this. Does anybody know what it is? That's a clay pot. Now the interesting thing about a clay pot is first off how it's made. It's pretty simple really. They have molding clay on a spinning table and the potter can put their hands on the molding clay and spin the table around. And when they do, they fashion something like this right there on the table. Now, it's still a little wet when they get through molding it, so they either put it in the oven or they take it outside and bake it in the sun. But uh, that's how they're made. And these have been around for a long, long time. In fact, in Jesus' time, this was probably one of the most common household items. Now, in Jesus' time, they would put wine in it. Um, they would put water in it to store. They would store food in it, their soup. It was basically used for just about any kind of storage you can think of. It was a very common household item. Now, our uh, scripture where Paul tells us that we have a treasure in one of these clay jars. Now I want you to look inside mine and tell me what you see. Nothing. I don't see a treasure, so I wonder what he's talking about. Well, Paul compares us to these clay jars. And one thing I think you should know about a clay jar is that it's very fragile almost like glass. If I were to break it, but I'm not going to because it's my wife's, but if I were to break this or drop it, it would just shatter into pieces. So it's very fragile, and fragile means that it can be easily broken. And Paul's comparing us to this clay jar. And I, I, see, the, I see where he's coming from in that. As a hospital chaplain, one of the things that I get to do every single day is see people at their absolute worst. They're sick, 
they come in after getting in a bad wreck, a car accident, you, you name it, and we get to see it all in the hospital. But people come in at their absolute darkest moments. And one thing I have found in my years as being a chaplain is that there's one thing, as they're laying there fragile, sometimes their bones are broken, they're hooked up to ventilators, there's one beautiful thing that can never be taken away from someone, even when they're sick and in their darkest moment. And that's their faith in God. And I see it every day with some of our sickest people. They are not going to let their condition get them down. They are gonna keep faith that God is still working in and through their lives. And Paul calls that faith the treasure that goes into the clay jar. So as fragile as we are as human beings, that we can break our bones in a car wreck, or we can fall and break a hip, or we could get sick with the coronavirus or the flu, there's one thing that even in our fragile and sick condition that can never be taken away from us, and that is our faith in God. And that is what Paul says is the treasure that's in the clay jar. And that treasure is deep inside in your heart. And I hope you never lose that treasure that each of you have. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks today for all the kids in the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area. We thank you for their wonderful hearts. We thank you for the treasure that they have in those hearts and their faith in you. Continue to sustain that faith for each of them. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys are all dismissed.
Greetings all of you. My name is Diane Moffitt and I am President, Executive Director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency and it is an honor for me to share with you the Word of God this morning. Our scripture comes from John 11 verses 28 to 44. Many of you are familiar with it. It's the story of the death of Lazarus. And it reads as follows. When she had said this, that's Martha, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again and troubled, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead men, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead men came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Won't you consider the subject with me this morning, tears of lament, tears of lament. One of the gifts mined out of the ugly institution of chattel slavery is the musical genre known as spirituals. Nobody Knows the Trouble I See is among the traditional spirituals first collected in an 1867 book, Slave Songs of the United States. The lyrics of the song are as follows. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. While we are living years beyond the pinning of this song, trouble is no less the order of the day for many of us. COVID-19 is hunting all of our humanity like a nagging hound from Hades. During its beginnings, it's shut down businesses, churches, commerce, and travel, and threw the entire world into quarantine. It continues to demand that we observe physical distancing, wear masks, wash our hands at every turn. COVID-19 forced PCUSA congregations into utilizing 21st century technology. It turned pastors into instant social media personalities. It drives the format for meetings and Bible studies. It forced the General Assembly to engage in a historic meeting by Zoom. It causes church members to postpone weddings, baptisms, and special events. 
Who can visit hospitals and assisted living facilities is determined by the virus. It's taking the lives of parents and grandparents, senior adults and frail elderly folks who are finding it to be a strong opponent of their existence. And when death snatches the lives from family members and friends, COVID-19 limits the in-person gathering of friends whose very presence provides a cloak of comfort in times of sorrow. If ever we were in trouble, we are in trouble now. COVID-19 is causing a rise in anxiety and depression. As individuals feel alone, families are relegated to continuous contact for those who are not able to return from work or who no longer have employment. Couples argue, children get frustrated, parents turn teachers wonder how they're going to ever make it. Domestic violence escalates. On the other hand, the coronavirus is making us refrain from being up close and personal with relatives and church members and friends we hold dearly. If ever we were in trouble, we are in trouble now. COVID-19 determines what businesses may open and what enterprises will operate. It influences when schools will start and how instruction will be given. College athletics, professional sports, concerts, Broadway uh, musicals and entertainment venues have been shut down because of this virus. It is running rampant and free. It's in the very air we breathe. COVID-19 is also disproportionately killing people who are poor and who are already living on the edge of society. It is unfairly targeting black, indigenous people and people of color who are more prone to die because of this this virus and COVID-19 is not the only pandemic facing our nation. There's also a COVID-16-19 that lingers with us. The virus of racism begun in that year when African people were kidnapped and forced to come to the shores of America in shackles, packed like sardines in the hull of ships, made to work without pay for over 400 years. The wealth and prosperity of this nation happened on the backs of enslaved black people who were exploited, abused, and misused by the founding fathers. Driven by money and mammon, they made structural racism the order of the day. It's baked into the very foundation of America, bathed in the myth of white supremacy, perpetuated by the reality of white privilege. Structural racism seeks to ensure whites dominate over those people of color. Domestic terror, cold, cruel, and inhumane deeds continue to be done to too many people. I can't breathe are the words George Floyd uttered as a white police officer placed his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, torturing him to death in broad daylight. I can't breathe are the words that Carlos Ingram Lopez said when he died at the hands of white police officers in Tuscan, Arizona. I can't breathe are the words that Manuel Ellis of Tacoma, Washington said as he was killed by police officers in his city this year. I can't breathe were the words cried by Eric Garner in New York back in 2014. I can't breathe are words that could be used to describe Ahmaud Omri's predicament as he was shot by white neighbors while jogging in Georgia this year. I can't breathe are words that fit the description of what Breonna Taylor suffered when she was killed by police officers who entered her home while she was sleeping in Kentucky. I can't breathe is what a host of people who see the death and injustice against siblings of color are saying. This racism pandemic is suffocating us all. On July 12th of this year, just a few days ago, my, my husband and I were walking our shih tzu down the street when a car filled with white men who appeared fairly young drove by. One man opened the door and shouted an obscene message to my husband regarding what he wanted to do to me. I turned to my husband who shook his head. You see, he grew up in Austin, Texas, being called the N-word by white folk who were essentially jealous of the position he had in music and sports because of his talent. I wish we were further along, but the truth is we are not. And if ever we were in trouble in this country and in our world, we are in trouble now. 
Trouble can fill you with sorrow and color you with sadness. Trouble can stain your soul and mark your mind. Trouble can make our, us fearful and anxious. It can depress and oppress us, especially when the trouble you are facing is marked by death, like Mary and Martha in our scripture read today. When Lazarus gets sick, Mary and Martha call on Jesus. After all, Jesus is a family friend. They break bread together. They spend time with each other. Mary and Martha know Jesus is a prophetic preacher and a powerful teacher. They know that he heals disease, eases troubled minds, and calms our fears. They know that Jesus can shake the mess out of misery and the stress out of our distress. He can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. They know this about Jesus, and some of us know this too. That's why we look to him in times of trouble. We call upon him in our needs. So I find it kind of strange that when Mary and Martha asked Jesus to come because Lazarus is on his deathbed, Jesus intentionally waits two days before coming to their home. By the time Jesus arrives, the funeral is over. The internment is complete. The repast has ended. The mourning and lament are well underway. When Jesus shows up, Lazarus has been dead for four days. That means in the black idiom, he is show enough dead. Because you see, the Jewish tradition believed that the spirit lingered near the body for at least three days. But after that, there was no way that a person would come back. When Jesus shows up, Mary and Martha perk up, expressing their sorrow, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus answers Martha first, your brother will rise again in verse 23. Martha replies, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. And when Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life, Martha appears to believe him. Though the fact remains that Lazarus is dead, Martha then goes and tells Mary that Jesus is on the scene. Mary and Jesus, you know, have a special bond. Remember, it is Mary that sits at Jesus' feet and gets the good portion. When Jesus sees Mary crying and the friends around them weeping, he is moved and deeply troubled. Jesus asked to be taken to Lazarus' grave. And there in front of the tomb, we read the shortest verse in the Bible. That verse said at the table, and the only thing between you and the dinner is the scripture and the prayer. Jesus wept. We cannot be sure why Jesus wept. He could have wept over the sting of death and its impact on our humanity. He could have wept over the lack of faith in him and what we fail to grasp in his teachings. He could have wept because he knew his hour was coming, for in John's gospel, it is the raising of Lazarus that leads to Jesus' crucifixion. The important thing to note is that Jesus wept. He takes time to sit with grief. He engages the laments of those around him. He does not judge the people for being weak. Rather, he joins them, expressing his own sorrow and vulnerability over the vicissitudes of life. To weep and lament, my friends, honors our humanity. We are made to feel emotion, to weep with each other, even as we rejoice with each other. Lamenting, crying out, and expressing to God our sorrow is what makes us human. Tears and lament are a way of releasing the pain of life and admitting our dependence on someone bigger than you and I. Jesus wept. When is the last time that you had a good cry? You cried because of COVID-19 and the millions who have died uh, or who have come down with illness and who have died. You cried because of the isolation you're feeling and the edginess of this unprecedented time. You cry because racism is alive and well in the church and the world, and there appears to be no vaccine for it. You cried over our unjust criminal justice system. You cried because Black Lives Matter and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Armory and George Floyd and a whole lot of other people should still be alive. You 
cried because the news commentators seemed to focus on burned buildings and not dead black and brown bodies. You cried over the plight of people who are poor and have more month at the end of the money. You cried because people without homes are more vulnerable in this climate. You cried because of the load being carried by parents, spouses, or heads of households. You cried over the state of the church in our denomination, for Sunday is still the most segregated hour of the week. You cried because you thought the church missed it, or you cried because the church did something that was contrary to your understanding of faith. You cried because you were angry and hurt with a relationship that did not turn out like you thought. You cried because something has died within you. You cried over the death of a relative or friend. You cried because of sadness. You cried because of grief. You are not alone. Jesus wept. Crying is therapeutic and human. Research shows that crying is self-soothing, helps to relieve pain, enhances our mood, releases toxins and it relieves stress, aids sleep, fights bacteria, improves our vision. Jesus takes the time to weep, to lament, to express in tears what he does not express with words. He gives his sorrow before to God and, and those around him are able to witness it. Jesus wept and in so doing, he invites us to weep. Our tears of lament help to clear the channel, release the sorrow and make space for us to feel God and for God to feel us with a sure and certain hope of resurrection power. You see, though Lazarus is dead, the fact is that the death is not the final condition. He will rise again. Though weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. Though lamenting may linger in the dark, light will dawn at daybreak. Though trouble may be upon us, glory is at the gate. Jesus wept, modeling for us the importance of weeping, which connects us with hope in God. It is this hope that breeds pliancy and creates resilience. It is this hope that can make you cry through the night and rise in the morning. It is this hope that keeps you fighting though the battle seems lost. It is this hope that makes me get up when I'm knocked down, bounce back when I'm thrown down. It is this hope that brings the kind of energy that we need to face the trouble of this day. It is this hope that keeps me and made my ancestors sing, nobody knows the trouble I see, glory, hallelujah. It is this hope that can make us sing too. May that be our song, and may our tears of lament point us to the hope that is ours and the one that we serve. Amen and amen.
Will you please join me in affirming our faith together as we use uh, the Apostles' Creed traditional and as you see the words on your screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you please bow your heads with me as we pray for one another and pray for our world. Gracious and holy God, in the midst of so much strife and uncertainty in our ever-changing world, we know that you are the one great constant, that you are always near, and that you care emphatically about your creation and all that is in it. And we praise you this morning for your good nature and loving self and your faithfulness to us and to all creation. We have come to understand that your constant love surrounds us at all times, that your presence is near to us in all places, even when we do not clearly sense it. And Lord, we lift up our prayers to you today, prayers for our world and this nation in these twin cities, that you can enable our world and nation, in this region specifically, to heal and to move forward but in a way that stands for justice and righteousness and as a mirror of your love for all of your people, regardless of skin color, citizenship, or socioeconomic status. Help us to love with blinders to all of our human-made barriers and give us the wisdom and courage to be the leaders for our community as we forge a new and better path together. We pray this morning for those who are weary and have lost heart, who have come to see this life as a burden rather than a blessing, that you fill them with the hope that comes with the faith and trust in you. We pray for those this day who are sick, dying, lonely, or suffering. We pray that in this time of trial, that they may know that your goodness and mercy is as close as their own breath. And we pray this morning, God, for our churches and specifically our pastors in this presbytery. May they find the rest, renewal, and strength that they need to continue to lead our churches and this presbytery in the direction that you will have us go, God. Give them a new spark, a new joy, a new excitement about their call to ministry and their call to be leaders in their churches and in their communities. May they be filled with your Holy Spirit as you empower them to be a force of good in this world. And finally, Lord, we thank you that no matter our circumstances in life, that you are right there with us ready to guide us, to support us, to comfort us and love us. And it's through this support, God, that we know that your goodness and mercy are from everlasting to everlasting, following us each until that day that you call us home to you. For this is our great hope in life, a hope that we place firmly in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. Loving counsels guide upon you with a shepherd's care and fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Unseen wings protecting hide you Daily manna still provide you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. When life's perils thick confound you, put unfailing arms around you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Keep love's banner floating o'er you. Smite death's threatening wave before you. God be with you till we meet again. Well, thank you very much for worshiping with us this morning. It is our sincere hope that the pastors of this presbytery are able to utilize uh, today and next week to uh, renew their strength, their energy, and their faith, and come back to their congregations and ready to do wonderful things. I want to thank the Reverend Diane Moffitt for uh, her sermon today and for contributing to this worship service. And I would like all of us to remember that we have these, one, this wonderful treasure in our heart, and that is a faith in Jesus Christ. So as we leave uh, our homes and we go out into the world, may we know that God is always with us and keep that faith deep down inside of us. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great, and my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the Your sight and your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, but the world to you about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears for the drum does fear, and the world is about to turn. Though